Welcome back everyone. Today I want to demonstrate how the focus on temperature anomalies severely misleads the public about the natural dynamics of climate change. Indeed, as illustrated here by NASA's 2016 winter temperature anomalies, the data shows the Arctic is warming four times faster than the elsewhere and winters are warming faster than other seasons. However, a dubious narrative uncritically attributes rising CO2 to those anomalies and then speculates about a future warming crisis while ignoring important natural dynamics such as ocean currents. But there is a wealth of scientific research that has shown ocean currents can also cause those higher temperature anomalies, but that isn't obvious from this anomaly illustration. To add to the misunderstanding, the high Arctic temperatures are paradoxically due to heat ventilating out from the ocean and thus cooling the earth and actually preventing future extreme warming. The warm 2016 winter temperatures in the eastern tropical Pacific were caused by a natural El Nino event that also ventilated heat previously stored in the Western Pacific, briefly warming the air, but again, actually cooling the earth. Now, El Nino events also contribute to warmer sea surface temperatures simply by reducing the trade winds that drive upwelling of cold subsurface water. Such warming, when upwelling is inhibited, is observed globally. For example, a three-month study showed how monthly changes in wind direction, the blue lines, caused a 8 degree centigrade 14 Fahrenheit surface temperature change. Along the coast of Oregon, when winds blew in a southward direction, upwelling is enhanced and surface temperatures fall, the red lines. Conversely, when winds blow to the north, upwelling of cooler, deeper water is inhibited, causing temperatures to rise by 6 to 8 degrees centigrade or 14 Fahrenheit. Such dramatic natural temperature changes have nothing to do with radiative heating from the sun or from greenhouse gases. But nonetheless, warmer temperatures from reduced upwelling are often mistakenly incorporated into the global average temperature as seen during El Nino events and then attributed to CO2 warming. It is far more insightful to understand climate change by looking at actual temperature changes. Using publicly available National Weather Service data, a quick survey here of subarctic temperatures on January 29, 2023 at 60 degrees latitude, just south of the Arctic Circle, reveals how ocean currents alone cause tremendous temperature differences. The Hudson Bay was minus 33 degrees centigrade or minus 28 Fahrenheit. Clearly, any warming effects from greenhouse gases do not prevent such life-threatening extreme cold. Such deadly cold temperatures evoke a much different concern for Hudson Bay inhabitants, the NASA's two degree warmer temperature anomaly that laughingly is suggest suggested is evidence of a global warming crisis. Temperatures in the middle of the Labrador Sea jump 34 degrees or 60 degrees Fahrenheit to a very livable temperature just below the freezing point. Further east, higher Erminger uh, sea temperatures rise above freezing to about 2.2 degrees centigrade or 36 degrees Fahrenheit. And the Norwegian current is even warmer at 42 degrees Fahrenheit. Now benefiting from the eastward winds that transfer ventilating heat from the warm Norwegian current, the Norwegian coast reaches a balmy 7 degrees centigrade or 44 degrees Fahrenheit in the dead of winter. Now despite the fact that all measurements were taken at the same latitude on the same date at the same time, there is a huge 40 degrees centigrade or 73 degrees Fahrenheit temperature difference between the Hudson Bay and the Norwegian coast. 
Now, indisputably, that variability is caused by heat transported northward by ocean currents and ventilated to the Arctic atmosphere. It is the ocean currents that are the Arctic's climate control law, not atmospheric greenhouse warming, is witnessed by the extreme cold in the Hudson Bay. Indeed, a map of the warm and cold currents entering those subarctic seas predicts precisely where temperature would be the warmest. The Norwegian current carries the warmest waters that originate in the Gulf Stream in the North Atlantic Current. A portion of the warm North Atlantic Current that veered westward while ventilating some heat plus mixing with cold East Greenland Current keeps the Erminger Sea just above freezing but cooler than the Norwegian Sea. Further ventilation of the Atlantic heat in mixing with colder water lowers the observed Labrador sea temperatures to just below freezing. NASA and a few other climate researchers have uncritically attributed declining winter sea ice to rising CO2 simply based on a negative correlation. Furthermore, by presenting the ice decline trend is representative of all the Arctic and not just a regional phenomenon, the National Snow and Ice Data Center's sea ice trend is a very misleading abstraction. Their global warming correlation does not hold for 80% of the Arctic winter sea ice extent. Inside the Arctic Circle, most of the winter sea ice extent has been, not been reduced suggesting warmer air purported to be derived from rising greenhouse gases has yet to cause any significant change. Furthermore, south of the Arctic Circle, there is scant reduction for Bering Sea Ice. Nor is there any change in Hudson Bay winter ice extent. Of course, this is expected with winter temperatures hovering around minus 33 degrees centigrade. National Snow and Ice Data Center's graph of winter sea ice is driven strictly by losses confined only to the regions where warm Atlantic water intrudes around the Norwegian Sea and more deeply into the Arctic Circle and the Barents Sea. According to the National Snow and Ice Data Center, heat transported into the Arctic Ocean has increased by 30 percent since 1900 making the variability of warm ocean currents the best explanation for the 20th century's ebb and flow of Arctic sea ice. The cause of variable heat transport into the Arctic requires examining a complex of natural factors driving the great ocean conveyor belt and its Atlantic segment known as the meridional overturning circulation. The Atlantic is unique in that warm water from the southern hemisphere crosses the equator and eventually reaches the Arctic. Furthermore, the heating of the water in the South Atlantic is partly controlled by the ocean conveyor belt's inflows from the tropical waters of the Pacific and Indian Ocean. Now, I won't discuss the circulation complexities any further here, except to share that La Nina conditions have a large impact. For those who want to understand the drivers of heating in those tropical waters, I suggest people view my previous video and blog on ocean heating, the science of solar ponds that challenges the climate crisis. Focusing on the Atlantic, research has determined that 45% of the water passing through the Florida Strait and into the Gulf Stream originated from the South Atlantic. Changes in the strength and location of the Atlantic pressure systems and resulting ocean circulation determines how much heat enters the Arctic Circle or is recirculated back southwards. Unfortunately, most illustrations of the ocean conveyor belt typically stop halfway up the Norwegian coast, but again, that is very misleading. Warm Atlantic water circulates throughout the Arctic Ocean and correctly predicts where Arctic temperatures will be the warmest. The warmest temperatures are where the Atlantic water first enters the Norwegian and Barents Sea, 
with ventilating ocean heat warming the air. Then slightly cooler Atlantic water continues to circulate through the three major Arctic basins beneath thick sea ice. A smaller volume of less warm water from the Pacific enters via the Bering Strait, whereas hardly any heat from intruding warm currents reaches the islands of the Canadian archipelago, explaining that region's extreme cold. Additionally, because the warm Atlantic waters resides between 100 and 900 meters depths in the Arctic Ocean with a residence time of 25 to 30 years, any cyclical slowdown of the Gulf Stream may not be detected in the Arctic Ocean temperatures or in a sea ice extent for two to three decades. Again, we can observe how the pattern of intruding warm currents drives Arctic Ocean temperature differences just inside the Arctic Circle at 70 degrees latitude. Around Wrangell Island, where cool Pacific water enters via the Bering Strait, the temperature was minus 16.7 degrees centigrade or 1.9 Fahrenheit. However, where little warm currents reached the islands of the Canadian archipelago, temperatures plummeted to minus 39 degrees centigrade or minus 39 Fahrenheit. For contrast, the North Pole temperatures are 8 degrees centigrade or 15 Fahrenheit warmer than the archipelago due to Atlantic heat stored in the Arctic basins in ventilating through the sea ice. Partly due to such heating contrast, Inuits hunting in the winter preferred to build their igloos on the ice instead of on land. Now, temperatures over the southward outflowing East Greenland current are minus 19 degrees centigrade or minus 3 Fahrenheit. In contrast to the temperatures of the adjacent inflowing Norwegian current, that is 21 degrees centigrade or 38 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. Natural dynamics affecting the flow of heat in the Atlantic segment of the ocean conveyor belt explains much of variations in the Arctic sea ice. One dynamic is the location of the intertropical convergence zone, or the ITCZ, which caused a dramatic temperature effect at the end of the last ice age. Ice core data shows temperatures that had been rapidly warming suddenly dropped by 20 degrees centigrade or 36 Fahrenheit in the Northern Hemisphere for about a thousand years during a cold period called the Younger Dryas. In contrast, Southern Hemisphere temperatures slightly warmed. Proxy data suggests the western trade winds in the ITCZ had shifted southward, causing the warm south equatorial current to also shift southward. Brazil's easternmost land, Ponta do Seixas, amplified that shift by deflecting more warmer back into the South Atlantic and thus cooling the North Atlantic. The warmer uh, 10,000 years of the Holocene period correlates with the ITCZ shifting northward, causing the warm South Equatorial Current to deliver more warm water across the equator to warm the North Atlantic while cooling the South. A similar but smaller southward shift of the ITCZ corresponds with the Little Ice Age, which mostly cooled the North Atlantic regions. The Little Ice Age ended around 1850 as the ITCZ moved northward for our most recent 150 years. Similar to the drivers that caused and ended the Younger Dryas, the Atlantic multidecadal variability, or multidecadal oscillation, represents 20 plus years of warmer temperatures in the North Atlantic than the South, and then reversing. The oscillation is intimately linked to variability of the surface currents in the Atlantic surface meridional overturning of the ocean conveyor belt. First detected in the 1980s and officially named around 2000, the positive phase represents a warmer North Atlantic that is linked to several climate dynamics. From the 1930s to 60s, and then the 1990s to the present day, 
the positive warm phases were associated with less Arctic sea ice, increased Sahel rainfall, increased hurricane activity, and frequent heat extremes in the southwestern USA. The negative phase from the 1960s to the 1990, represented in blue, saw a reversal of those dynamics as Arctic sea ice rebounded from its 1930s low extent. Accordingly, a 40-year research project over the Arctic Ocean during a cool phase and published in 1993, determined there was an absence of evidence for greenhouse warming over the Arctic Ocean. So for your sake, please understand these natural oscillations. Knowledge protects you from fear-mongering politicians who blame the loss of Arctic sea ice on the car you drive or that you like cooking with a gas stove. There are three guidelines to consider to prevent being victimized by their climate misinformation. First, consider all the science. An abundance of researchers report warming dynamics other than CO2. Science is a process and nothing is settled yet. Second, become well acquainted with natural climate change. Natural climate change serves as the baseline or the control data from which to accurately judge the effects of CO2 emissions. The purpose of my series of climate videos and blogs is to provide a better understanding of the science of the natural climate changes to the public. And finally, embrace renowned scientist Thomas Huxley's advice that skepticism is the highest of duties in blind faith, the one unpardonable sin. Thank you for watching.